Foundation Trust. We've got a very full agenda, I think 359 pages in total of uh, the board back. Um, so I will be keeping things going um, at a clip to use the phrase. Uh, welcome to members of the public who are joining us today. And for those um, unable to join us, we are recording the meeting. But before we get the main uh, business of the meeting going, I just want to uh, comment on uh, two people whose uh, last formal board uh, this will be. The first is Les Cabourn, who has been uh, a governor at, um, at the Trust uh, for many years. And Les has been an exceptional public servant, uh, has done quite phenomenal things in his role, um, including being chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board and has been a great friend of the Trust in many, many ways. So, Les, I just wanted to publicly thank you for the work you've done for the citizens of Warwickshire in very many different ways. And uh, so thank you very, very much on behalf of everyone. Thank you, Richard. Uh, this, the second person I want to thank is Anne Pope. Uh, Anne joined the Trust, I think, 25 years ago um, and has been our HR director for the last 15. Uh, she joined, I think, as a medical secretary originally and worked her way up. Uh, so it's a great encouragement in many, many different ways to people. She's been a wise counsellor mm -hmm. to uh, myself and also to Glenn. Um, and I think was Glenn's first substantive appointment back in the day in 2007. Um, and I know we will all miss you greatly. Um, we will miss your warmth, your kindness, your wisdom, um, and your, as I said, wise counsel. So, Anne, uh, thank you very much. Um, and the final person just to thank is Zoe Cox, who has been um, looking after us as a a trust board uh, for the last couple of years. So Zoe, thank you to you as well. So um, thank you all very much. I think a digital round of applause uh, to <laughs> those great colleagues of ours. Okie dokie. So I don't think we've got any apologies for absence. Uh, so any declarations of interest? Please raise a digital hand if you have at this stage. Oh, sorry, I, I must apologise. As well as saying goodbye to people, I'm saying hello. To, uh, I did it earlier in our board workshop to Yasmin Becker, who's one of our two new non-executive director uh, appointments. So, Yasmin, welcome. Um, and next month, we will be welcoming David Spraggart um, as our other new non-executive director. Um, and I'm sure both of you will add enormous value uh, to our deliberations as a board. So the last set of minutes held on the 3rd of March, was everyone happy with the accuracy of those minutes? Please raise a digital hand if you weren't. Thank you, I'll duly take those as uh, agreed then. So in terms of action points arising, which is on page 19 of our pack, uh, the first was for Anne to bring a look back over the year on international nurse recruitment. Um, that's on the agenda within the integrated performance dashboard. So we'll pick that up then, and thank you. Uh, the second was for Glenn to keep the board appraised on the progress with the CWPS network meetings. Um, Glenn, do you just want to give us quickly an update on that? Yeah, so I have met with the pathology network director and requested that we have a further network meeting. It may well be that he's awaiting the publication of the national uh, pathology strategy revision, which we're expecting in the next month or so. But uh, I, I've, I've certainly uh, asked him for a meeting as soon as possible. OK, thank you. And then on the uh, integrated performance dashboard, Helen, to bring an update on the restoration recovery position to the next board. Uh, do you want to do that verbally now, Helen, or later on? It's in my board paper, Chairman. OK, super. Thank you, Helen. Um, and then for the future, we've got Helen to bring the perfect week outcomes to either a board workshop or the board meeting. So that's organised for next month. Look forward to that. And then Kim to bring an update on the elective incentive scheme once available. Uh, Kim, do you want to pick that up in your report or do you want to pick it up now? Uh, I can pick it up now. So there's no impact for the elective incentive scheme for the year just finished. 
and then, then there's a new elective recovery fund um, scheme for the new year, which uh, I can pick up uh, in my main report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. And then Anne, to include some data within uh, her report around recruitment figures by gender profile, disability profile, and the number of people that related to. That's coming back in July. So uh, we look forward to that when we sign off the Equality and Diversity Steering Group, or once it's been aligned with the Equality and Diversity Steering Group. Now, Charles, to bring back the medical revalidation report, that's scheduled for later this year. Um, and to invite two members of the Bain Network who've been allocated places on the National Res Expert Programme. Uh, we're seeing them in July, looking forward to that. Um, Fiona, to ensure an update on the recommendations following Ockenden, um, are brought back to the August uh, board meeting. Uh, that will occur um, then, so thank you for that, Fiona. Um, Charles, uh, the full data security and protection toolkit assessment report to be brought back on the 2nd of June. So we look forward to that, Charles. And then Helen to bring an update on the operational planning and modelling for next year to a future board meeting or board workshop. Helen? Uh, that will be in the May um, workshop. OK, great. Thank you very much, Helen. But lots of good work as we've been briefed um, by the board uh, previously. Um, so, any matters arising that I've missed, please raise a digital hand if there were. Okie dokie. So, the annual financial plan and contracts. Um, Kim? Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, so, I, I, I did brief the um, board um, this morning in the workshop session uh, on the key highlights, but just for, um, so I won't go into too much detail, but really, just to outline really that we had the planning and operational guidance for the new financial year issued quite late in the day and that was sent out on the 25th of uh, March. The key assumptions in the financial plan is that it's based on set uh, block allocations uh, consistent with those that were issued for the second half of the last financial year and they're the same for the first half of this financial year which they're now referring to as H1. Um, we've reflected really the sort of two year impact of a full year developments and um, business cases uh, and unavoidable uh, cost pressures in our financial uh, modelling. And we've also set a stretch uh, cost improvement target for the organisation at 3%, uh, which equates to uh, £9 million in order to start working up the schemes um, uh, uh, you know, and, and realise some of the um, efficiencies uh, from working differently uh, as a result of uh, COVID. Um, the other key things to note is that we will be planning a break-even plan, uh, which is consistent of the system ask. Um, the new um, um, scheme um, that's been offered is called the Elective Recovery Fund, and this will operate at a system uh, level. Uh, and it is depending on the trust um, uh, achieving certain thresholds uh, on, on performance uh, uh, as a percentage of the uh, baseline of 1920, uh, which is set out in the, in, in the paper. Um, I've detailed a breakdown of the various developments and cost pressures, and the appendix one shows those in a, a much more detail. So I'm asking the board really to uh, note uh, the sort of planning assumptions and the risks associated with the plan uh, and to approve uh, the, the budget uh, moving forward for, for, the next, for the new year. I will be bringing back another plan um, for the second half of the year once we know further details of what that looks like. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, questions and perspectives. We did spend, uh, for members of the public, uh, a fair amount of time this morning going through the detail uh, of this. Uh, Glenn? Yeah, as table one sets out, I think it's good that we are setting a plan that's the right side of the line. Um, as you say, Kim, a, um, a break even or a small surplus is, is what we'll be, we'll be going for. As you've identified, though, the, the we've included a SIP challenge, which um, has allowed us to fund some cost pressures in the organisation so that it feels like the balance is right on that. So I'm very supportive of it. One of the big opportunities, as Kim said, is the is the elective incentive scheme this year, um, which even though it will be paid at system level, 
um, uh, we should be, uh, as we discussed this morning in workshop, we should be making sure we identify the costs associated with delivering activity above those thresholds. Uh, and then whatever happens across the NHS or across the system, at least we'll have separately identified that that as cost above the level that we're funded at. But um, other than that, I'm, I'm very supportive of the plan. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, and uh, just again for uh, members of the public to, to fully appreciate. So uh, the system, I come to in Warwickshire in our case, is incentivized uh, to deliver certain year on year targets in terms of elective activity. Um, if one of the providers, for example, us overperforms, but the others underperform, and therefore the system in total underperforms, the system wouldn't get the bonus. And that's what Glenn and uh, Kim are, are sort of alluding to. So that's something we need to watch. But um, as an outstanding foundation trust, we pride ourselves on um, trying to be at the forefront of transformation and productivity. And uh, this year will be no different. Um, any other questions or perspectives to Kim? Okie dokie, super, thank you. So um, if you are not happy to approve uh, the annual financial plan and contracts as outlined in the papers. Please raise a digital hand. Okie dokie, super. Thank you, Kim. Duly approved. Uh, we'll then move on to the annual capital programme update and capital programme quarterly update. Sophie. Thanks, Russell. Um, so if I just start with last year, it was quite an eventful year in terms of COVID, but also very significant for us in terms of capital spend. And there was a number of projects that we talked about at board before that we were able to deliver this year, um, really through teamwork around estates, capital operations and clinical teams working together. So that saw us refurb our ITU, um, the paediatric assessment unit and the pre-op assessment unit. And a number of those projects it meant were really um, completing at the end of March, which has put pressure on us to turn that round in terms of financial spending year. Um, just to give an update from the paper that's been circulated, um, finance have just let me know we're on 80% spent um, with a forecast of 97% by the end of month 12. Um, and Kim's team are working to try and get all of that um, accrued this year for the spend that we did. So, so that's just on last year. In terms of this year, um, as it sets out in the paper, there's been lots of negotiations with the system around our CDAL limit, which is really starts to dictate the size of the programme that we can do and the ambition um, for our trust. And what's happened is actually as a system, we agreed to prioritise um, St Cross in rugby's theatres because we know um, in terms of our recovery um, and restoration across the system, it's important that they can access that um, and it needed essential refurbishment. And what that's meant is that we have had to reduce um, SWIFT's proportion of their capital allocation. Um, since this paper was written, Kim um, this morning gave us an update that that has actually been reduced even further. So in terms of the board understanding the impact on our programme, um, I just wanted to highlight what, what that looks like um, for clarity. So it will mean that a number of our large capital schemes will need to be rephased towards the end of the year, um, which will put the pressure on us being able to access that CDAR limit the following year. Um, that specifically is related to the cath lab and also um, some of our developments with GPs, so Ellen Badger and Lillington. Um, in terms of our medical equipment, you'll see in the paper that we have had significant spend over the last two years in that area. So this is an area we'll look to reduce the spend this year, um, but with that brings risks. Um, so our unallocated element will enable us to be flexible through the year. And finally, some essential maintenance will have to be delayed um, into later in this financial year or even into next year. So we'll manage the programme like we did this year with kind of tight scrutiny ourselves around our delivery programmes and making sure that we're really flexible if we're not going to spend money in certain areas that we're looking to reprioritise it against those um, projects that we did want to complete this year. And I know as, as part of the system um, conversations, we've shared with the system where some of those projects would be. And just finally to note, um, I think it's important for the board to recognise the amount of planning that needs to happen this year. There's some really key strategic developments for the trust to look at for the following capital year. So this will include Stratford, medical education and frailty. Um, they're going to become real pressure points for our trust, um, especially things like the medical education around the increase in students we're expecting. So um, just an awareness of some of the cases as well um, that will be coming through to the board. I'm happy to take questions. 
Thank you very much, Sophie. So just uh, contextualizing things. Uh, I think this year has probably been the uh, year of highest NHS capital spend, certainly in my 15 years um, in the NHS. Uh, it's been an extraordinary year, but uh, going forwards, capital is going to be given at system level and again will be divvied up at system level. The consequence for us this year is that we are getting many millions less uh, than we would originally have hoped to have got and therefore we are having to prioritise accordingly given the money that we've got to ensure that we optimise our capital to serve as many citizens as we can in an efficient way, which improves the health outcomes of the population that we serve. Um, Glenn, uh, questions or perspective? Yeah, I mean, firstly, well done, Sophie and the team, for um, spending up to last year's capital programme. That obviously included some additional funding that we received in year for some of those urgent schemes around, uh, about, around reworking the estate, around uh, A&E, et cetera. Um, uh, and I think we were probably one of the only trusts that, that actually delivered against that promise, which was they had to be operational by December. Um, but it is frustrating that, that we, um, we are, we're having to hold back on our capital spending limits. I mean, what's, what's slightly more frustrating is that we're not asking for capital. You know, we have internally generated capital from surpluses in previous years and from depreciation. Um, so we have the money available for these projects, but the system were given a basically an ultimatum that unless we uh, agree to operate within a ceiling, then the funding that was going to be provided for UHCW and their electronic patient record program would have been held back. So we certainly didn't want to be causing that. So we've we've reduced our plan spend. I think the other thing, just to make sure the board is aware of, the car park scheme, which has commenced. Um, I am assuming that I can get separate cover to spend uh, the five million pounds associated with that during this year. If we don't, then we, we'll, we have a, a slight risk there. Um, at the moment, the legislation has not changed in the foundation trust still have the freedom to spend their capital. So I hope we don't need to test that legislation out during the course of this year. But um, to support system partners, I'm, I'm happy to support the proposals that we've set out. Thank you, Glenn. Um, uh, other questions or perspectives from colleagues? OK, uh, thank you, Sophie, for your oversight and uh, management of the capital programme. Um, as I said uh, a moment ago, and Glenn has just reinforced, clearly we'd like to spend more capital on all of the things we'd like to uh, do on behalf of our citizens, but uh, we are being limited in our budget, which is forcing us to make hard choices. Um, so uh, if you are unhappy to approve uh, the capital uh, programme uh, for the year ahead, please raise your digital hand. Julie approved. Thank you very much, Sophie. Uh, we'll then before move on to the Foundation Trust Code of Governance review. Sarah. Thank you. Um, so this is an annual requirement for the board to consider the trust compliance or non-compliance with the NHS FT Code of Governance and include a statement in the annual report. So I've undertaken a review and propose that we declare non-compliance with the provision B 1.2 and include the proposed explanation in the annual report um, that's detailed in this report, but and then declare compliance with the re remaining provisions. A public governor has queried the reference towards the end of the report about the nominations and remuneration committee considering the appointment rules for any group roles in the future. This has been checked with the FT advisor who has confirmed that that is the plan for the future. Um, so happy to take any questions and propose the recommendations. Thank you very much. So any questions or perspectives on the Code of Governance review? Uh, please raise a digital hand, therefore, if you're not happy to approve. Julie approved. Thank you, Sarah. And then we move on to the Thank annual you. review of committee terms of reference. Thank you. So each committee has undertaken a review of its terms of reference and the proposed amendments are shown as track changes for the board's consideration and then for approval and ratification. Thank you very much, Thank Sarah. You. We'll 
all of the different subcommittees have been involved in their own um, review process. Uh, thank you for everyone who's been involved in this because I know the work of the subcommittees is uh, very comprehensive. Any questions or perspectives from colleagues? If you're not happy to approve, uh, please raise a digital hand. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Duly approved. And then the annual review of Register of Directors, Register of Directors Interests and Non-Executive Director Independence Review. Sarah? Thank you. The points that I'd just like to add to my report are that um, Yasmin's declarations of interest and on the register of directors, she hasn't been included because there's been a slight delay with some of the pre-employment checks. So the formal paperwork has not yet been progressed, but I believe that that is being undertaken now. So an update will come back with Yasmin's declarations to the next board meeting. Also, since submitting the report, Rosemary's advised of an update to her interest. Her husband's been appointed as a member of the Council of the University of Warwick. OK, thank you. So thank that you. needs to be included as well. Any other questions or perspectives on the annual review of directors, directors interests and non-executive director independence review? Please raise a digital hand if you're not happy to approve that. Julie approved. Thank you, Sarah. And then finally, the fit and proper person's annual declarations. Thank you. Happy to take this report as read and to for it to be formally received and noted. Thank you, Sarah. Any questions on the uh, fit and proper person's annual declarations? Uh, if you're not happy to approve, please raise a digital hand. Julie approved. Thank you, Sarah. You can now relax. Obviously, Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so we then move on to the annual review of KPIs, including the quality indicators. Helen and Fiona. Thank you, um, Chairman. Um, this is, um, uh, uh, as we said, the annual review of um, the board um, KPIs. And so you'll see the format of the um, report um, remains the same um, as it has done in future uh, in uh, previous years. Um, what we have done is reviewed the operational um, priorities and planning guidance, also um, the system oversight frame, framework, um, to um, note any changes that we may need to be reporting on a board level. There are a number of changes, and these are set out in the report, but for ease of um, noting, they're highlighted by green in the dashboard. Um, this um, paper has been to um, uh, non-exec finance and performance committee and been approved there, so I'm just asking the board to um, approve the changes to the key P uh, KPIs um, for the integrated performance dashboard. Thank you, Helen. Uh, Fiona, anything you want to add? No, thank you. No, thank you, Chair. OK, uh, any questions or perspectives? Uh, Glenn. Apologies, Helen. I mean, this, this has obviously come a little bit late in the day in terms of the elective incentive scheme. But shouldn't we be looking at the year-on-year uh, -year comparative data on that routinely. I, I appreciate when you pulled this together that was an unknown scheme, but it feels like that would be a useful addition to our dashboard. Yeah, absolutely, Glenn. And I think this will change as the year um, rolls on as we receive more guidance and we're expecting phase four, I think, letter at some point. So um, I think there'll be further guidance that, um, that does come out. So yeah, I'm happy to um, um, amend it for that. Thank you, Helen. And uh, Rosemary? Yeah, um, Helen, yes, happy to approve. Um, but as I was going to say, we've added some. I don't think anything's been taken away. So perhaps when the next review goes on, perhaps it's time just to have a, a close scrutiny as to whether everything that's done there at the moment is essential or whether there's some possibility of reducing some, just because I think at board level, it's it, it's getting where we need to be for focusing our attention on the key on the really key indicators that's, that's important. Uh, I think what is fair to say, um, Rosemary, these uh, many of these, apart from the local um, uh, KPIs that we set ourselves, are nationally mandated, and so they're in in there. I think having reviewed a number of uh, other um, organisations' board papers, we've probably got the smallest integration board dashboard of, of other organisations, and we have tried to. Um, uh, 
get some parity um, across the foundation group um, as well. I think we did take some out, but I probably haven't put that in there. So I'll just check which ones we took out. I think we took a couple out. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Rosemary. Any other questions from colleagues? So uh, if you're not happy to um, accept the annual review of KPIs and the adjustments with the amendment that Glenn suggested uh, that Helen and Fiona are recommending, please raise a digital hand. Julie approved, thank you. Um, we look forward to another year of strong performance. Um, so we move on to then the performance review and assurance part of our report. Uh, Glenn. Thank you. So um, quite a big report this month. I won't go through every single item. Um, we obviously talked about the budget at the start of this meeting. It's an unusual scenario that we have uh, a settlement for the NHS nationally of the first half of the year and a, and a second half of the year to follow. But that's the position we're in, understandably, because of the, the unknown impact of COVID and COVID recovery. We talked through the elected incentive scheme, so I won't talk about that again. Planning guidance was received very late this year, but it contained no real surprises. The only thing I'd just draw out for the board's attention is the purposes set out there, four of them for integrated care systems. That very last one is a is a new addition to the list. So helping the NHS to support broader social and economic development. And we'd already incorporated in the objective that we set um, uh, a month or so ago um, to demonstrate our role as an anchor organisation in, in the system and to, to work with system partners. So we'll definitely be taking that forward through that. Um, the, one of the main things though in the in the guidance uh, and the objectives for the, the for the year that's now started is 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 around maintaining staff well-being. And so as we as we look at our ambitious plans to stand up our elective activity and to and to meet those targets, we need to make sure that we are working sensitively with our workforce uh, to do so. Um, we talked about system level capital allocation, so I won't dwell on that. Uh, I also reflect here on the recent meeting of the three boards of the foundation group, which I always enjoy. Uh, and part of that, we take a best practice um, session from, from each of the trusts, and it was great to see an update on our uh, award-winning uh, maternity service uh, in South Warwickshire as part of that. And then talk about Ellen Badger, which is, which is, I have to say, is quite a frustrating situation that we've got into with, with the Ellen Badger project, which is, a, as the board are aware, we approved a business case earlier in the year to, to invest in Ellen Badger, but it has not been uh, so well received by our League of Friends. They have uh, commenced a, um, a campaign uh, including a um, petition um, which is entitled Save the Ellen Badger. So I, had a, I almost went to sign it myself, as I say in the report, had a look at it. And, and what it's describing is um, a threat to the future of the hospital, which is something that certainly isn't, uh, isn't a, 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 a real threat to, to the hospital. And we've not been presented with this petition. I'm sure we will at some stage. Um, I had a look online at the people who signed it, and, and sadly, a lot of people who signed it are, are under the misapprehension that the hospital is under threat, which is really disappointing. It's having an impact on staff recruitment and retention. So we just wanted to really set out clearly here what our plans are. We, we, we passed these through uh, a further information update to the community that we serve in, in Shipston and Stour and, and surrounding areas that we we are proposing, as we have from the start, a, a two-phase project that will, uh, in that first phase, which will also bring the GP practice onto the site, we will uh, create over 100 rooms, 27,000 square feet of, of space. Um, and um, it, it, will, it will create a hospital. And, and I think one of the things that um, the League of Friends is slightly confused by is is the word hospital to us is about providing a premises through which we deliver healthcare. Um, it's not about uh, necessarily reproviding beds, although the beds on the site will remain and there's a there's a review underway of the beds across the system to determine how many beds we need in the future. But as we did with Stratford Hospital, where we created a fantastic new ambulatory hospital with not a bed in it, the future for hospitals, um, very much in the future, is to keep people at home, not to admit people to beds. 
So we've been surveying, this has delayed the project a little bit, I think that's well worth emphasising to the board. So we have surveyed um, uh, local community, had a really good response, 550 responses that they really do support what we're setting out to do. So um, notwithstanding the capital constraints that we just described, we do hope that we can start something later in the year. Um, League of Friends don't want to support this part of the project, but we would hope that if phase two commences, then that's something they may want to support us on, uh, as indeed they are the friends of the hospital. So I then talk about the staff survey um, and um, really good um, uh, results again for the trust this year. So we, we stood out nationally fifth best staff survey results in the NHS. We spent some time at workshop going through that. So I've included in Appendix A, um, the summary of our results. Um, and you said it at the start, Chairman. Um, this is the last set of results I'll be looking at with Anne Pope, who's been my HR director throughout my time here at the Trust, and she's contributed so significantly to um, the fantastic culture that we have and the results that we have before us today, and, and I'll certainly miss her. Thank goodness they're changing the survey for future years, so she won't be able to hold me to account for the trends that she'd started. Um, uh, and then we talk about some more of our great team, so volunteer services and, and all of the work that they've done over, particularly over the last year to help us with COVID. And then finally, High Sheriff Award, which um, I had the pleasure of joining last week virtually, the very last day the High Sheriff was in office, uh, awarded our infection prevention control team uh, one of his achievement awards, which, um, which was well deserved. That's all I wanted to go through. Thank you very much, Glenn. Um, questions or perspectives to Glenn? Just to emphasise, Glenn, your point on volunteer services, I've been talking to lots of volunteers um, uh, within the community and the, the sense of esprit de corps of those, particularly on the vaccination programme, who have volunteered to help has been fantastic. I think if there are a few positives that come out of the COVID pandemic. And I think one of them has been uh, the engagement of volunteers in our work as a trust, which has been wonderful. So thank you to everyone involved. Colleagues, happy to move on to the integrated performance dashboard. And do you want to introduce it for us, please? Sure, please. thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the Integrated Performance Dashboard covers um, month 11. This was very much, we were still um, emerged uh, within our response to trust to, um, to the second uh, COVID-19 uh, way. There are three points I really would want to draw out uh, before handing over uh, to colleagues and taking uh, the board through the report in more detail. The first is the um, assuring uh, friends and family uh, test report that was received for February um, and you know, showing that 96% of patients who completed the survey had a positive experience. Secondly, the impact of reference to COVID-19, but it, it, the, the, what we saw patients very often delay um, uh, due to patient choice, delay their treatments, but more importantly, how clinical teams have continued to adapt it, both in the delivery of uh, new models of care, virtual uh, appointments, in sort of in, in, in ensuring that uh, we continue to adapt um, our operational um, models uh, to, to, to reflect um, to reflect that. And finally, just of note in the HR director report is the review of the year uh, just gone, and pleasing is really the that we've seen is the note notable reduction in voluntary uh, turnover and reduction in vacancy. So those are the three points I wanted to draw out before handing over to my colleagues. Thank you very much, Anne. Any questions or perspectives on Anne's overview or should we dive into the detail? Okie dokie, thank you, Anne. So uh, Fiona, do you want to head off first? Yeah, thank you, um, Chair. The, so um, my report um, includes the normal exceptions that I have been including uh, all year. That will change next year in line with um, what we've just heard around the changes to the integrated dashboard. But I um, will be um, 
uh, including other exceptions in this uh, in this part of the report. And primarily, they will be. Um, we talked about these at, at uh, patient safety, surveillance, and clinical governance around. Um, elements around deteriorating patient and respect. This, that's one thing that's come out of um, COVID in terms of a change in how we um, um, have seen um, clinical teams um, embracing and having conversations about patients that are dying or um, are at risk of cardiac arrest. So I'll be including some of that data, MSSA, uh, bacteremias, and um, and also incidents or complaints around discharge will be a regular uh, report here. The other um, um, element I want to bring up is that we have seen a change in our profile of serious incidents recently, and you'll you'll see the top category now has changed from slips, trips and falls to being one of missed or delayed diagnoses in the table one um, since since October. Um, we obviously with all serious incidents do a full RCA and investigation and there has been differing themes um, that have come through there but as a response to that change in, in, um, in theme we, um, I've commissioned the head of governance to do a review um, and a sort of an uh, analysis of all of the learning, the root causes and the actions that have been come out of each of those as a way of um, just making sure that any best practice that we've implemented is shared across all specialities. But also, have we missed anything and is there anything more that we can be doing to prevent these? I think if um, I think back um, you know, it's it, it, the, some of it is to do with an increase in the waiting list. So there are more people waiting um, on there. So more chance of are, of them um, being delayed or missed. There's a there is a theme that's coming through about um, uh, waiting list management. Um, and also sort of changes to pathways that we've used, uh, that we've had to implement due to COVID. But there's also been some exceptional um, work done by specialities to make sure that those lists are managed really safely. And so I, um, I've talked to my exec um, colleagues, Charles and Helen, about making sure that that is shared across the organisation and also the foundation group. So. Um, that project is being kicked off. It will be reporting into clinical governance on a on a regular basis, and um, and um, I'm happy to well, happy to include that as part of the exception report going forward as well. I suppose just to add, just as an th extra thought, then I hadn't planned this, but maybe to members of the public. Whilst we are working through this, there possibly is a public message about if you feel that you've been forgotten or missed or that your appointment is delayed and, and unexpectedly, then contact the hospital um, um, and, uh, and the clinical team to, um, um, if, if you're unsure. No, that, that, that's great. Thank you, Fiona. And I think that last yeah. point is an important message. I and mean, it is worth... Um, again just emphasizing to members of the public uh, that we are very aware as a board about the increased waiting times due to the prioritization of COVID patients during the pandemic and members of the public may, may not uh, appreciate but just for clarity um, because of the protocols we've had to put in place in terms of infection prevention and control uh, if you like before COVID, if we were 100% uh, productive, with the protocols, we're down to about 80%. It, it has a big impact, the protocols on infection prevention control and distance and everything else on our core productivity. So not only do we have a higher waiting list, uh, but we um, have the challenge of uh, closing that gap as quickly as possible. Um, on that uh, impact of the COVID protocols. Um, Questions or perspectives to Fiona, Helen. Uh, thank you, um, Chairman. I, I just would like to say that we've, um, um, recognising the challenge that we do have um, with the waiting list, we have done significant piece of work with um, GPs um, um, across Warwickshire. And um, if patients do feel that their condition has worsened, 
then the best thing they can uh, can, can do is um, go b back to um, their GP rather than a phone call or uh, hopefully a phone call and the GPs will then fill out a profile which will come to our clinical teams um, to make sure that those patients are then um, triaged and put onto the waiting list in an appropriate place. So um, so that's the route that, um, that patients should take if they think their condition has worsened. Um, if patients are um, concerned about where their appointment um, is, there is there is an email address which will make sure it is it is very very um, visible on the website that they can email in um, if they if they've got a query. So, so the best thing to do is not to ring um, if you um, uh, uh, ring um, through into the department because they're inundated by phone calls. But there is a an email address which that can be um, dealt with, and we'll make sure that that's um, very very visible. So ongoing work around that since the beginning of the pandemic. Thank you, Helen and uh, Charles. Yeah, just one small clarification, Chairman, is that I think it would be uh, best to say that we prioritise patient care on the basis of clinical need, whether they've got COVID or not, because this uh, question of prioritising COVID is sometimes misreported in the media. So it's all, all emergency work and all urgent work. No, absolutely. Thank you, Charles. Any other questions or perspectives to Fiona? OK, thank you very much, Fiona. Uh, Charles, if you could take down your uh, digital hand, that would be great. Um, so, Helen, what would you like to pull out of your report? Thank you, um, Chairman. Um, I think the performance um, across um, all of the metrics um, within the Director of Operations report um, reflects really where we were um, in February at some um, high levels of COVID patients within the organisation. So, performance had been challenged, as I had discussed, in the month before of um, January. Um, we are starting to see um, recovery um, um, as we speak, particularly for um, March's um, performance. And um, we, um, we have started um, with um, many of our um, elective um, procedures. So you will start to see that coming through um, the report. Um, even though we were still um, uh, managing very high levels of COVID patients during um, February, the, um, the bed occupancy um, still remained quite low, which meant that we had um, appropriate number of beds in appropriate places for all patients that we were seeing and um, both for our cancer surgery and any emergencies that came through the, um, the through the front door. You will see um, in the report that the diagnostic wait times have significantly improved with just a couple of areas that are causing us some um, challenge um, around the performance but action plans are in place for each one of those. And, um, and we know that cancer uh, performance has significantly struggled during um, the COVID um, pandemic, but I've just received um, uh, information that we will start to see that improve significantly during March. Now we are in a, in a much better place as an organisation and all our theatres are operating at full um, capacity. Um, within the report, you will see um, a number of other um, regular reports that we have from each of the divisions. But the one thing that is um, new um, is the, um, the beginning of um, starting to look at the KPIs for the, um, the IT um, service. And so we've started to set out some of the things that we are measuring um, already. I know it's not a great chart. I apologise for that, but more work will be ongoing um, on there around some um, KPIs, really, and some performance metrics that we're expecting um, from the team. And as transition um, through... Um, um, through the um, IT services, occurs we'll be able to monitor um, that performance over the next, um, over the coming um, months. Um, it, the last page of my report sets out our position um, in terms of our restoration against each of the um, activities that we were um, required to um, to meet um, in uh, as part of the phase three um, letter, and you'll see that um, our February um, performance. Uh, is quite strong and um, given that we were still in the height of um, the, pan uh, the pandemic. So um, really good um, strong um, recovery um, happening during March and I'll update the board on a regular basis against those performance metrics. Now we know that those have changed slightly um, as part of the um, operational planning guidance. Take any questions. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, again, a very comprehensive report. Uh, questions or perspectives to Helen? Uh, Bruce? Thanks, Russell. Uh, Helen, 
Really great performance. Love, love your people for all the stuff that they've done for the last few months. Um, a couple of the graphs interested me, and maybe this is because we did not, as I shall be saying in a couple of items time, actually have a clinical governance in, in March. Um, the two graphs I'm interested in are page um, 189 and 190, the bottom of 189, which is also labelled page 19 or page 184, depending on your system. The normal vaginal birth rate, your commenting is down, but within common cause. I'd like to pick that up uh, in clinical governance, please, next month, um, with particular interest in why and there are some comments uh, elsewhere in the press about birth rate going down. But um, more of interest, I think, is is the one on the top of page 190. Um, I'm a bit confused by the word decrease in the title um, and indeed where the red line is on the graph. But the commentary is more of an interest and I think we should also pick that up under clinical governance next month because uh, the why for those two sets of data, the 39.2% quoted and the 6.6, .6, I think would be of interest to clinical governance. Is that a, a reasonable request from the data that you've seen? Yeah, absolutely. I apologise for the decrease in um, emergency section rate and the, uh, the typo on that one. But yes, yeah. we'll, um, we'll get the team to come and present that in clinical governance committee. Yeah, thank you. Thank we, you, we did, Thank you, we, Bruce. We did, we did miss the um, Women's and Children's Day out last month, so it could come up then. Thank you. And Glenn. Hello, and obviously we talked earlier about the elective incentive scheme and we're, and we're talking about benchmarking our performance as percentages of what we did before. I just thought it might be useful for just you to explain why it is that we are not able to deliver easily the levels of activity we did before because of some of those infection prevention measures we take. So maybe just a little bit more insight because that might be helpful. Yeah, OK, thank you, um, Glenn. So because um, of um, social um, distancing um, requirements, but also particularly when we are looking at our um, electives or our surgical um, pathways, it's very, very important that we keep our emergency pathways separate to our um, elective um, pathways. And we call our elective pathways super green. So patients are asked to um, self-isolate and they are screened prior to admission and they are screened on admission. So we keep those pathways completely COVID um, for, um, free. And also we are very, very strict about um, visitors in and out of those um, ward, ward areas because we know some of the challenges that if patients um, become COVID positive during the post-operative um, um, period. Now, what that means is, is particularly for theatres, and um, the way um, uh, in the past, the way the theatre suites have, have been designed, particularly in day surgery, means I now have a stranded theatre, which I cannot use. And what that does is impacts on about 50 plus lists um, uh, per, uh, per month, which means I've got 50 um, operating lists um, down um, in relation to what our normal activity would look like. So that's challenge number one. Challenge number two is that we cannot put so many cases um, on a list, again, because we need appropriate downtime and cleaning, additional cleaning, etc., between each one of those um, cases. And it's mainly around downtime and within those theatre um, areas. So what that does mean is that theatre productivity is down um, significantly, but we are working really hard to see whether we can um, uh, work um, safely um, around that, particularly to get the stranded um, theatre back. So it might mean that we do um, green lists in the morning, red lists in the afternoon, etc. But we're, we're working through that with infection control um, teams. Um, the other challenge that we do have is around outpatient um, um, activity and again um, that um, is around social distancing and not allowing lots and lots of people as we did before to sit right next to each other in, within um, outpatients. So managing the outpatient flow as you can imagine through um, lots and lots of different outpatient clinics has been quite a challenge um, for the teams but also making sure that our clinics are um, as full as they, uh, as they have been um, in the past. So we are promoting virtual clinics and that's really, really important because 
that is really the way we need to go forward if, if patients aren't having an investigation or a procedure carried out within an um, outpatient um, environment then we should um, encourage as much um, virtual um, outpatient appointments as possible and this should then help us um, build our capacity um, back and the other third is the, another reason is particularly around um, our diagnostic um, capacity particularly in relation to um, endoscopy cystoscopy um, and um, colonoscopy uh, and again this is around infection control um, measures and making sure that there is appropriate um, social distancing, there are appropriate infection control measures in place between each one of those um, patients and appropriate decontamination. So again we are working um, really really um, hard to um, turn that activity around and actually we're in a very very strong position around uh, uh, around that but that's taken us some time to be able to um, to be to build that um, capacity. So um, it, in order to um, meet um, the new requirement um, set out in the guidance and um, around the 70% standard across um, many of the um, met, uh, the um, modalities as such that I can confirm that we have we will have delivered those all in April so we'll have met that and um, we met at lunchtime to um, discuss what that looks like um, across the system to ensure that the system um, delivers that and we can reap the benefit of the, um, uh, the um, elective incentive scheme. Thank you, Helen. You did ask, Glenn. And um, <laughs> just before we move on to Anne's report, um, Charles, anything you want to brief us on in terms of mortality? Um, just as you will see, the indicators remain very stable in control limits um, and the shimmy um, up to June last year, which incorporates the first peak, um, you know, is uh, 0.97, which is as low as it's been in a number of years. Um, we, we are now, you can see, uh, seeing the um, deaths from the second peak beginning to show through um, and time will tell um whether whether we've done um any any differently from what's expected when the um uh, benchmarking comes through but generally a stable picture uh, I'd, I'd also note the medical examiner uh, system is working very well um but we still haven't um uh, got a, an it system uh, due to some um, some problems in implementation thank you charles any questions on mortality from colleagues Colleagues have to move on to Anne's report. Anne. Thank you. Um, as Anne introduced uh, earlier, you'll see that I've brought a review of our recruitment activity for the year. Um, it's out of interest as much as anything. I think I've every month reported on a high level of, um, of activity and interest in all of our roles, which is fantastic. Um, as promised, I've particularly focused on international recruitment and brought the numbers there. But as you can imagine, this is a particularly difficult programme of work and it has been and continues to be um, as we go through a global pandemic. So it's sort of credit to the team really who supported the nurses who've already arrived and those that we're supporting to bring into the country and into the trust. We're putting in significantly more pastoral support than we have done before, both for those new recruits and the staff that we've already got. Because as you can imagine, um, having arrived in a country and realising it's going to be very difficult to go home to visit your relatives or to have relatives visit has been particularly difficult for those staff. We've got a challenging programme moving forward in that they, we plan to recruit between 40 and 50 international recruits next year. And we've put an additional practice development post in to support them as they arrive to make sure that we take them successfully um, through that uh, that OSCE process and get them into registered um, registered and into post. Um, moving on to sickness, this is always a difficult one really because it's validated data, so is already out of date, significantly out of date when I bring it to board. And so next month you will see the predicted. Um, quite dramatic drop in sickness levels and as I said this morning we are actually um, yesterday we were at 2.7% of total 
um, staff absent. So there will be a significant change next month, but this is validated data as it was um, at the time of the report. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Anne. Questions and perspectives to Anne. Uh, Glenn? Yeah, it's great to see such dedication from our staff with those very low signal levels. And we, we saw evidence of that this morning with feedback from the community staff, the way they'd responded to COVID. It's a question of, of bureaucracy, really, for you, Al. Back in 95, no, November 95, you applied for a job with a job description that fitted on half a side of A4 with six objectives in it. Why do we now have multiple uh, job description pages for staff? <laughs> so, yeah, it's so clearly far more pragmatism at the time. I mean, as you know, Glenn, the job description that forms a part of your terms and conditions. So getting that described accurately and correctly is important. Okay. Um, and also to support um, appropriate job evaluation. OK, good answer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Colleagues, happy to move on? Okie dokie. So, Kim, tell us about the money, please. Uh, thank you, Russell. So, this is the report for the month ending um, February, which reports a surplus of £186,000. Uh, uh, we're obviously finalising the year-end position now, so we're working on um, the, 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 the annual accounts, and uh, we're just finalising that, but we are going to be reporting uh, close to break even, but obviously on the right side of the line, uh, as Glenn puts it. Um, in terms of other things to note, to draw out of the report, um, I think I just wanted to uh, uh, bring to attention really that the um, the cash flow forecast, uh, we are due to update that to reflect the uh, the amount of um, capital accruals that uh, we're, uh, we're going to be putting in really for the, uh, uh, for the, for the uh, year end. Uh, and that's uh, linked into the point that Sophie made earlier around the uh, capital position, uh, where we're basically saying that 80, just over 80 percent of the spend has been accounted for this year, that there is a significant amount of capital accreditors to effectively uh, uh, put in for, for the month of uh, March. Um, that's all I really wanted to point out. Um, the last thing was just to say that we are revising the uh, format of the reporting uh, for the new year. I'm trying to be consistent with Y Valley and George Elliott to give Glenn and Russell a bit of ease in terms of, uh, you know, seeing, rather than seeing different reports, it'd be pretty much the, the same sort of format. Um, obviously, the contents will be slightly different, but the, uh, the formats will be similar. All right. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Um, questions and perspectives to Kim. We spent a lot of time on finances this morning in the board workshop. Okie dokie. Colleagues, happy to move on to the monthly safe staffing report. Uh, Fiona, over to you again. Yeah, uh, with everything that's already been said really about recruitment, uh, retention, um, the vacancy position improving, the sickness position improving, I, I haven't really got anything else to add to, to what's already in the report. It's um, it's a healthy position and, and um, much better than previous months. Thank you very much, Fiona. Um, questions and perspectives to Fiona on the monthly safe staffing report. Thank you, Fiona. Um, so we'll move on then to the Clinical Governance Committee verbal report for the 10th of March. Bruce. Thank you, Russell. Uh, uniquely, I have to report that we did not hold a clinical governance meeting as planned on the 10th of March. Uh, teams crashed in the morning and unfortunately we only did the minimum requirement for approval over email. Um, Jeff Ben had kindly agreed to chair it for me and colleagues took some very sensible supportive decisions so we approved over email um, the Clinical Governance Committee Terms of Reference Annual Review and Schedule of Business Review. And you'll see that you, we've already seen that reflected in Sarah's uh, subcommittee's report. And just for clarity, uh, that is very similar to last year's. So it is just swift membership. We also approved the uh, three serious incidents recommended for closure and uh, we closed those. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Bruce. Um, Bruce, when do you intend for us to go back to the full agenda of the Clinical Governance Committee? 
Um, well, I'm hoping as soon as possible, uh, whether we manage it next week or not, I, I doubt, but I would hope that by May we would be back to uh, a full agenda, if not mostly full next week. OK, thank you very much, Bruce. Any other questions to Bruce? Thank you, Bruce. So we then move on to the uh, non-executive director finance performance committee report for the 2nd of March and the verbal report for yesterday, the day before yesterday. Simon. OK, thank you, Chair. Um, so the report, the written report, I verbally reported on the last meeting, so I don't intend to I take that as read. Um, yesterday we had a very constructive discussion. I think there's three things really to tease out from there. <clears throat> Firstly, I think there's a nervous, nervousness around the new financial regime still, um, particularly at the system level to ensure a reasonable and appropriate allocation of funding. Um, we had a very good discussion around divisional objectives. There were some good stretch targets in there and encouragingly some pathway objectives with a strong patient focus on what they're doing about making the pathway carry the patient and deliver a good, good experience. So I thought that was encouraging. And then we had a, a particularly good discussion around productivity. There's some good work being done on measuring it and helping us drive productivity. We looked at a variety of measures and there were degrees of hardcoreness about some of the measures we saw. And I'm sure that doesn't exist in the dictionary as a measure. Um, and I think there were some very hardcore ones that were measuring um, pound per activity and activity per whole time equivalent that can operate at both a macro and a very micro level, almost down to an individual. And I, I think those were very good. And I would encourage us to particularly focus on some of the hardcore measures um, in the organisation. And there was also a discussion about how we report on a monthly basis in the board reports, a set of measures that help the board overall get a sense of how we're doing on productivity. But some good discussions were taking place. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, uh, any questions or perspectives to Simon? Thank you, Simon. Uh, um, I know that governors who have been observing uh, that uh, subcommittee were, um, I think, uh, impressed by uh, the, the quality of discussions going on just to share with members of the public. Um, the uh, annual report of signings and sealings. Sarah. Thank you, Russell. Um, so just for noting in information. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Any questions to co from colleagues on the annual report of signings and sealings? OK, thank you, Sarah. Then the Foundation Group Strategy Subcommittee of the 22nd of March. Chris? Thank you, Russell. Um, just to share with colleagues that we had some really good reports in terms of the existing areas of joint working. In particular, particular note was the IT services and transfer and the good um, and ongoing engagement of staff. Um, and also two two new areas which were around evaluation of clinical services and staff well-being um, and then the final point um, item four was the review of the foundation group which disappointing um, recommendations weren't supported um, they were felt to be overly bureaucratic so those are the notes okay thank you chris it's not quite the sort of um uh, uh, conclusion tone that I think people reached. I think they just wanted to make it all workable. But uh, questions or perspectives to Chris? Uh, Rosemary? Rosemary, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Apologies. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm disappointed that the recommendations were deemed to be over overly bureaucratic because that certainly wasn't the theme that was coming through when they were presented to to audit committee and that certainly it would not be the intention of audit committee of, of the audit committee that a recommendation should be of a bureaucratic nature so um I think in response to that, Rosemary, there was a, a view that the foundation group was working well in terms of sharing 
good practice, which it, which absolutely we would endorse and, and agree. And it was felt that um, by taking the recommendations, it was creating an additional layer of bureaucracy that wasn't necessary. Um, I think that was the view overwhelmingly. Um, it's it's I, I think that the the foundation group would would benefit from a little bit a little bit more structure. I made my feelings known in the meeting, um, but I think overwhelm, overwhelmingly people felt that by creating that extra layer of structure, it would probably create some sort of bureaucracy that wasn't necessary. Um, although it was very you know it is supported in terms of the sharing of good practice. Yeah. yeah. And so, and so the whole sharing and communicate, I mean, so I think the, some of the messages were coming about was sort of the communication between both sides, you know, yeah. between both, organi both organisations was really, it was really important that that was happening. And I think some cases it was felt that that hadn't always been happening. Yeah, Glenn, you put your hand up. Yeah, I think the general sense of it is that we've we've learned a lot from some of the projects that we've we've pushed through. Uh, through the group level and and I'm sure if we we had our time again with them they would be slicker because some of them took longer than, than we would have liked but I think all of that learning has, has been absorbed by the exec teams involved and I think I think one of the other things that we we have learned is that the exec level responsibility for projects and including some of the work that the company is doing rather than it necessarily being at chief exec or managing director level the individual executives take responsibility as leads uh, and, and, and responsibility for that communication as well to their teams, um, which was which was a useful learning point. And, and, and I have to say, over the last few months, I've seen much more of that in in, in practice. Yeah. yeah. And I think yeah, one of the lessons you. that has been learned is um, certainly my experience of the last meeting was that the level of information um, discussed has been greater, and the you know having much more information and detail within business cases has certainly been a lesson that has been learned and I hope that that will continue because I think that's been the gap over, yeah. over the past few months. No, I, no, I, I totally agree with that, that point. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, any other questions to Chris? Okie dokie, so we'll move on. Thank you, Chris, to the COVID-19 update, Hannah. Thank you, Chairman. I think this is the last one for me for a bit, so I <laughs> have a break from my voice. Um, so this is the um, your um, regular COVID-19 um, update um, report and um, this is probably one of the reports that's the most up to date so I'm um, reporting that up to this um, moment. So um, it, it is fair to say that I, I believe we are, are, are through um, our, 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 our wave, our second wave and that the organisation has um, reset itself into its normal um, bed base, which is really, really positive, particularly for our, um, uh, for our IT, uh, for our ITU. And that elective um, activity has, um, has begun, it began on the 1st of March and is well underway now to um, deliver, as I said earlier, um, the requirements are set out in the um, operational planning guidance. Um, I think that um, we, there's a number of things that we need to be doing um, over the next um, uh, few, um, well, few days actually, because we've just been um, asked to start planning for a third wave in um, any time after um, June towards um, the autumn to understand what um, what, a, what a third wave may potentially um, impact on us um, as an organisation, but also to ensure that we're continuing with all elective and critical um, care activity. And as you know, I've already been planning um, for this one. So the next board um, workshop, um, we'd already set that up as uh, for a, um, a winter look back, a COVID look back, but also that look forward in terms of what living with COVID for the next year will look like for us for um, an organisation. So my um, ask of board really is um, that I don't produce this um, report again unless we go into a, um, a, a third surge, but I could, uh, I, I'm intending to do a short briefing within the um, operations director reporting the integrated performance dashboard. So I'll just give out numbers of where we are and if there's anything that the board needs to be noted on rather than an individual paper because we are in a significantly improved position. Absolutely. Thank you, Helen. Um, questions and perspectives to Helen? Bruce. Thank you, Russell. Um, 
Helen, I'm a bit curious about the graph B, chart B, chart A, sorry, to start with, which is on page three or 242 of the, the big pack. Um, I, I under, don't understand the purpose of it, really. What's the purpose of putting the same red data on the top of the blue data? And that's just how that's, um, so that's presented um, for the year. So that's just how that comes out out to us from a uh, from a local point of view. So that's just the the regular chart that you see here every month, and you have seen here every month. So it'll be the last time you do see it. <laughs> okay. Well, let's park that one. The the um, chart B. Um, we've got a long history of because you've used that very successfully to plan for the winter. Um, with the increased uh, infection prevention measures, what do we see happening to core beds, for instance? Does that go down? No, because we don't know what we don't know, really, in some respects, um, uh, Bruce, as, um, uh, oh, you mean in terms of the social distancing beds? Yeah. Yeah, they've been taken out already. So they are okay, out so they won't go back. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. And any other points to Helen? I think it's just worth re emphasizing. I think it was you, Bruce, who made the point this morning that, um, and Jeff as well, the uh, key thing we do need to ensure is that the positive transformational productivity benefits of different ways of working and a more agile way of working, um, which were required to ensure we could cope with COVID, needs to be introduced into business as usual. So our core productivity uh, increases. So uh, I know you'll take that forward, Helen. Colleagues, happy to move on. So we're then on to the risk management part of our agenda. Bruce, could I ask you to take your legacy hand down, please? And the first is the VAF report for last year and the risk quarterly report. Glenn? Yeah, sorry. When I say Glenn, I mean Anne. You, you, you do want Glenn because the, the, the previous agenda item was the year end report on trust objectives. I apologise, Glenn. <laughs> um, so we'll rewind a little bit and we'll do the year end report of trust objectives first. Thank you, Chairman. So uh, this is a section that we always include in the annual report, which looks back on the performance against the objectives that we set prior to the start of last year. And I think that's worth noting because obviously it was prior to COVID that we set uh, these objectives. Despite that, we made some really significant progress in a number of these areas which take us forward strategically. And, and COVID has helped to accelerate some things, including things like uh, outpatient redesign and transformation, but um, we've also been able to accelerate some of the, the developments of place-based working this year because of the uh, impending um, uh, legislation changes. So um, a, a, a section of, of, of green and, and some ambers, no reds in there, uh, um, with the board's approval, we'll include this in the annual report when it's produced. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, any questions to Glenn on the year-end report to just objectives? I think in the context, Glenn, of uh, COVID, I think it's a remarkable um, set of outcomes you've been able to achieve as a team. So on behalf of everyone, thank you. Um, now, the much-anticipated uh, board assurance framework and risk quarterly report, and Thanks, Chair. Um, this detailed report has been authored by uh, John Bills. It provides an overview of the risk uh, profile and, and approach uh, to uh, risk management. The BAF for quarter four is presented. Um, there is one uh, risk, uh, risk uh, 1525, which, re which relates to the delayed and slower public expect engagement on the end of life uh, strategy. So there's been a change in that risk score in the last um, quarter. This report also picks up um, an action uh, from Board of Directors back in uh, February of 2021, um, giving, giving some consideration you know, to identifying uh, black swan events. Um, these are events which happen infrequently, but um, have uh, catastrophic uh, consequences. So we undertook um, with with support from uh, from Joe, uh, a, a review and the review is detailed uh, within the report as are the findings. Um, it is recommended um, and, and this is, these recommendations were considered by risk management uh, board last month. 
um, that as part of our next schedule for review of the risk management strategy, we include a process to ensure that there is that oversight of uh, work streams, risks and mitigation in its broadest sense uh, that we program into um, our schedule, um, the trust workshop schedule, that six monthly review of all risks um, within across the organisation in its widest sense. And that we, as part of our risk management training, uh, which is provided on an annual basis to senior senior managers, uh, that we provide that um, Black Swan event training um, as part of our next scheduled uh, training session. So we're asking today for just noting um, and approving the, uh, the, the BAF for 2021, um, the risk register and the uh, Black Swan uh, report. Thank you. Somewhat ironic that we talked about Black Swan events before the pandemic, isn't it, Isabel? Um, questions and perspectives to Anne? Most of me, as, as Chair of Audit, are you happy with the uh, way we, we're thinking about risk? Yeah, I think particularly doing, ha having that extra exercise going through of looking at those bigger picture and you know, disastrous risks was very helpful to get people starting thinking out a bit more outside outside of the box um, and so I'm really pleased that that's going to be built into the into the process on ongoing and obviously from an audit committee perspective our internal auditors review the BAF process each year. Um, I'm waiting to see the report this year, but uh, it's generally been a very positive report on the process. So I'm expecting that to be the case this year too. Thank you, Rosa. Any other points from colleagues? So uh, we're uh, very uh, blessed, citizens are blessed to have a very effective um, uh, health and wellbeing board in um, Warwickshire. Um, and so the next item on the agenda is a Warwickshire health and wellbeing strategy for the next five years. Anne? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, we are very blessed um, to have a very uh, robust um, health and wellbeing um, board under the able chairmanship of uh, Les uh, Claiborne. Um, the strategy has now been uh, produced. Um, it's been a fantastic exercise of engagement with the public, with stakeholders. Uh, the document is, is attached as an appendix. The also produced has been an easy to read version, which um, is, is excellent. Um, and for us going forward as, as, as a lead provider, um, the health and wellbeing strategy provides a really useful uh, framework for South Warwickshire Place objectives and going forward the South Warwickshire Place plan for 21-23. Um, so this, uh, the, the, the health and wellbeing strategy is here today for noting. Thank you very much and I, I think it's quite an outstanding um, uh, a piece of work and Les you look very handsome on I think page four. Um, any questions or perspectives on the health and wellbeing strategy? I, I would really encourage members of the public. I know it's a, a weighty term, but it is well worth reading to understand how all of the various different partners in the health and wellbeing space come together to understand what the current needs are in the uh, JSNA, as it's called. Um, but also the way the priorities are set and then the practical actions coming through, combining the work of the NHS, social care and our voluntary uh, and other community um, colleagues. So, uh, and a really great list of everyone involved in the process, I think, on the final page. Um, thank you very much, Anne. Uh, we'll therefore move on to the um, board committee minutes, uh, the first of which is the clinical governance uh, committee minutes of the 10th of February. Bruce, anything you want to add? Nothing to add, Russell. Happy to take questions. Thank you very much. And uh, any questions from colleagues? Please raise a digital hand. Thank you, Bruce. And then the uh, non-executive director finance and performance committee of the 2nd of February. Um, Simon, anything you'd like to add? Uh, nothing to add, Russell. Any questions from colleagues? 
Okay, thank you. So I think we're then on to um, any other business. Any other business from colleagues, please raise a digital hand. Okay, no, any other business? Thank you. So we've got questions uh, from members of the public and governors. So we've had a few. Uh, would you care to read them out for me? Thank you. So the first question is from Roger Lloyd, public governor. Is the chief executive confident that there's been sufficient learning from the few in hospital acquired COVID infections that going forward with the ramping up of cancer and the elective caseload, the infection control measures will be sufficiently robust to prevent in hospital acquired COVID infections in the future? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. So um, one of the reasons why I asked Helen the question earlier about the, the impact of COVID was just to reassure the public of the steps that we take to keep all of our patients safe, those coming in for planned care, but also those coming in as emergencies. And that, that, has, that has led to some capacity reductions. But even with the, the relatively low levels of COVID that we're now experiencing, it's really important that we keep those measures in place and keep everyone safe. Um, we, we can expect COVID to be with us for the foreseeable future. We've obviously always had healthcare acquired infections also um, and we've got a very good track record. So yes, there have been some nosocomial infections in every single hospital in the NHS, and we had some ourselves, but our levels have been really low. Uh, and, and whenever they've occurred, we've we've carried out root cause analysis to understand whether there's any learning from them. It's been particularly challenging with the Kent strain, which has been um, particularly virulent in terms of transfer from individuals, but um, we've got some good arrangements in place, which Helen outlined and which Fiona and her team uh, have supported from an infection prevention perspective, which means that we've, we've learned lessons and we're, we're, we're ready and able to cope with the recovery response that we outlined earlier. Thank you, Glenn. And so the next question, please. Thank you. Um, so Jill Sutherland, senior reporter at Stratford Herald, has asked two questions. The first one being more than 2,250 local people in Shipston have signed a petition asking for the original proposed hospital to go ahead. Will the board take their concerns seriously? Glenn, I think you're going to answer this one, aren't you? Yeah, obviously I touched on this earlier uh, and the petition is entitled Save the Ellen Badger Hospital. Um, and um, I think it has confused people. As I said earlier, I've looked at the uh, at some of the responses on there. People are saying things that I'd absolutely support. Um, you know, things like we support the uh, the transfer of the medical centre onto the site, but we, but we want the hospital to remain, and that's exactly what we want. So we'll listen to all of those people um, because it's our plan to retain the hospital. And uh, thank you, Glenn. And then Jill's second question, please. Thank Sarah. you. And this is the last question that we've got, Russell. So Jill asks, in recent liter literature confirming phase one on the redevelopment of the Ellen Badger site, Swift said it was disappointed with local fundraisers for not contributing the money raised for the hospital to phase one, GP surgery, etc. when this would clearly go against their stated fundraising objectives and therefore charity law, which has already been explained and discussed with Swift. Furthermore, it states that Health Centre will only go ahead with local fundraising support. This literature is surely misleading and seeks to put a negative spin on the earnest campaigners for the hospital. Could I have the board's reaction and why this is the project not contingent on local fundraising? OK, so I'm happy to take that one too, Chairman. So, I mean, firstly, phase one isn't just the GP surgery, and I think that you know, and that it's been disappointing that it's been presented as, as such. Um, as I explained earlier, it's um, as well as moving the GP surgery onto the site, we're creating flexible outpatient capacity, basis for staff, a health and wellbeing centre. Uh, and also we were proposing with the addition of, of fundraising that was originally promised by the League of Friends to support us on. Um, we were going to be landscaping the gardens and, and actually making this first phase an enhanced uh, uh, building, um, which is which is exactly what we did with the Stratford Hospital project. Similarly, with the Stratford Hospital project, we outlined the future state, which had further phases, um, and um, the people of Stratford got behind us. The League of Friends of Stratford were really active in in that fundraising campaign. So, um, so 
So that's what we'd hoped with this project. Unfortunately, uh, the League of Friends would rather support the beds rather than the first phase. And we, Chairman, you and I met with them and, and uh, accepted that was their position. Um, I, I don't believe that it's against their stated fundraising objectives to support the hospital. That is their stated fundraising objective. Um, and indeed, they will be in receipt of funds for that. Um, one of the funds that they have access to is the Percy Lomas um, legacy, which um, was a legacy that was split between Stratford and, and Ellen Badger. Um, and we used the money at Stratford to create the Lomas suite, which is the health and wellbeing centre, and, 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 and not to create a, a bedded area. So um, so I, I think we could, we could use that funding. Um, but if the League of Friends want to come in and join us at a later stage, um, if phase two commences, then uh, obviously we are very willing to do that. Um, the project is not contingent on fundraising, though, just to make that clear. We, we were, we've accessed some national funding to do the phases of the project that are identified in this year's capital programme. Um, and we will be using our trust capital programme uh, into next year for the other pieces of work. The funding for the uh, GP facility is completely separate. Uh, and we are indeed not asking for any fundraising whatsoever for that element of the project because that's a separate private business that is using the site very helpfully co-located with with the trust um so um hopefully that that clears things up um the as I say with the help of fundraising we would we would hope to enhance the facility which is exactly what we we did at stratford and we're very proud of what we created with the, the input of the local community there Thank you, Glenn. Um, we're uh, doing quite well in terms of time, so I'll just um, I'll see if any other members of the public uh, want to raise any questions. If you have, please raise a, a digital hand. Okie dokie, so um, thank you all very much. Um, it's been uh, lovely seeing you, uh, albeit um, just um, digitally again. Um, I do think we'll be continuing to meet digitally for the foreseeable future, uh, but I look forward to seeing you at the next board at the beginning of May. Um, but again, just to reinforce the points I made at the start, enormous thanks to Les uh, as for your friendship towards the Trust. Uh, you've always uh, uh, been a critical friend. And as a result, we've uh, benefited from your input uh, to add for your loyal service to the NHS. The NHS couldn't have asked for a more loyal servant. Um, and I know that Glenn in particular, but also the rest of us will miss you. And Zoe, thank you for your help over the last couple of years. Um, that's the end of the meeting. Um, colleagues, we will start the confidential board at 